Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> for those who don't know me, my name is Paul Draper. Uh, I'm working with Julian at Sea Salt Learning. And uh, welcome to the Sea Salt Learning webinar today. Uh, a couple of years ago, Julian released his first edition of the Social Leadership Handbook, exploring the concept of the social age and the net model of social leadership. Thanks for joining this webinar. As it goes on today, please feel free to ask questions both in Q&A and in chat. Um, there's Q uh, chat functionality on the side there and Q&A either on the top or bottom of the screen, depending on the client that you you're using. Uh, please remember to switch your chat to everyone so all the folks can see your comments. Um, Julian is going to run through a presentation. You can comment throughout this talk, um, <clears throat> but at the end we'll also try and do a session of Q&A as well. If you'd like to come on screen during that time, just uh, let me know explicitly in the comments and I'll make you a panellist for that question. So that leads me to hand over to the founder and captain of Seasalt Learning. That's Julian Stodd. Thanks a lot, Julian. Thank you. Very smooth, Paul. Let me just uh, let me just bring up the presentation here. Okay, can you see the presentation? Okay. Okay, it's not arrived just yet. Okay, I'll tell you why. It's because there you are. Bear with me while I just uh, change one setting. Leia Stewart and Julia Meninga has, have joined us. Oh, okay. guys. Hello, Julia. Share screen. There we are. I think we've got a few others coming in. There's Leah, another very familiar Twitter friend. Real life. Okay, so now I think if I. If I do this, hopefully you will see a presentation. How's that? Yep, all good. Okay, good. That's the uh, technical rehearsal out of the way. Good, so thanks for joining here. This is going to be a small, very informal um, webinar session. There's only, a, I don't know what there are, six or so of us here. So. Uh, I'm very happy for this to be more of a conversation as we go. I can see the chat box. Um, you can ask questions either in the chat or in the Q&A function. This is actually the first uh, webinar we're running using Zoom, so uh, a little bit of learning all around. Um, the aim of these is to be very much working out loud uh, sessions, so just sharing ongoing thinking and ideas. Uh, you may have seen there's a series of, of these ones around the second edition of the social leadership book. Uh, this one is on the need for social leadership. So it's really a foundational piece talking about why we need to um, build uh, socially dynamic organisations and what we mean by the socially dynamic organisation. And the next one will go into the real detail around the, the model itself of social leadership. We'll touch on it today, but we'll go into more detail after that. And then I think we've got a third one lined up, which is about you know, how we build those capabilities, just to give you a, a sense of the flow. So these are uh, due to form new presentations. So first time through this one, some new imagery, a few new ideas in there. And uh, we'll run through it, see how it goes. So I'm starting um really just you know why are we here why are we um talking about social leadership well my argument would be because the things that we've done before uh won't get us where we need to get to so we know within organizations how to develop managers we know how to induct new starters we know how to do leadership training uh, and that's all well and good. We probably need to continue to do all of that stuff. The challenge that we have is that we need to do more. And we need to do more because the ecosystem that we're living in, the world that we're in today, has changed. Um, the notions of power and authority have changed. The channels of communication have changed. The technology that we communicate through has changed. Uh, you could probably argue that the underlying sociology itself has changed the ways that we um, find our identity and express our identity um, the consequence we feel from our actions there, there are any number of elements of our ecosystem which have changed and hence we have to adapt so 
it's, uh, it, it, it's fairly clear that organizations that fail to adapt, that fail to be open to new ideas, may be fine trading today, but will lack the ability to innovate, to attract and retain the best talent, um, to be agile. And by let's use a, a simple definition of agile in this context, it's the ability to solve problems differently tomorrow from the ways we solve them today. And I use that phrase quite deliberately because um, effectively, if we rely on system and process and trained competence, we'll get very good at solving the problems that we know. But if we're going to face uncertain challenges and evolved threats and indeed new opportunities, we're going to need new ways of solving problems. And in general, I would argue, these ways are going to involve um, a broader view, a view that can only really come through community and social filtering mechanisms that we see so prevalent now in our uh, everyday lives. So it's no coincidence that I asked this group earlier, when did the uh, Edinburgh Festival finish and discovered a wealth of information, you know, hidden within the community there. So people gave me the dates. Uh, David commented, that uh, I can expect hotel prices to stay high for the next few weeks. You know, I'm, I'm able to garner information that I want from the, the community itself. So these ideas uh, are, are, um, are ones which I've just released in the, the second edition of the Social Leadership book. Um, just to be clear, this isn't a sales pitch. If you're interested in, on this call, just drop me a note and I'll send you a copy very happily because as you'll know, one of the the tenets of social leadership is, is to share ideas and work out loud. And so I value any thoughts and feedback on that. And you never know, it might end up in the third edition. Um, but these are, these are the three areas we're going to, to run through today. The foundations of the social age, just exploring that, that, that space that we're operating in a little. The uh, need for social leadership. So just going in some detail about, uh, you know, why do we need to evolve the, the the ways we uh, develop leadership within the organization and indeed who will hold leadership so hang on to that notion because we're used to formal hierarchies of power where leadership if we express leadership as the uh, ability to influence or uh, direct action is held within the hierarchy while social leadership can be much more distributed than that it can be uh, within the network if you like uh, so we'll, we'll need to uh, consider that as we look at how we develop it. And then the aspects of the socially dynamic organisation, that's really the newest piece I want to build out. And I'll use that as a, a chance to link us through into some of the other work around organisational change. So, you know, the social age, how do we define it? Well, in, in the simplest of terms, I, I, I've taken to using this slide, which is really um, to indicate that it's it's more than just the not it's not the digital age <laughs> let's sort of be clear about it the uh, technology that we see around us and which is you know revolutionizing every aspect of uh, how we live our lives today is a visible manifestation of change um, but to be clear it's not the thing itself it's it's the canary in the mind you know it's a, it's a visible manifestation technology facilitates social change and it's the social change i'm primarily interested in we know that there's going to be tons of uh, great new technology and indeed uh, paradigm shifts in how we use technology there's quite a lot of interest this week around hearable technology uh, so a couple of the manufacturers of hearing aids have worked out that they can actually start to introduce layers of augmented reality into the audio feed around you. And there are a couple of um, interestingly non-Silicon Valley startups uh, who are looking at this. So um, not only how can you give people directions as they're walking, but how can you analyze the audio around them, the audio environment, and add layers of contextual information around that. So you know technology is going to continue to change and we could talk all day about that. But Within this new environment, what kind of uh, leadership do we need? Well, you know, here's one thing to consider. One key change in the social age is that knowledge itself has changed, um, not in a, a philosophical context particularly, but in a practical context. So 
most of us, I would imagine, grew up in a time when we had libraries and we went to universities. And those universities, you know, contained uh, professors who held knowledge and seminar groups and rooms where we shared that knowledge and libraries where knowledge was was codified and accreted. And there were editorial guidelines and review processes to ensure that only proper knowledge could be held in those places. Indeed, we had a sort of a great concern that the right type of knowledge was given, uh, that it was valid. That notion of validity is important because today, of course, we live in a, an age when knowledge itself is substantially uh, distributed. It's no longer concentrated so much in those centres of learning or centres of excellence. Indeed, that very notion may be outdated. It may be held in a community of excellence. Um, knowledge is often adaptive. Um, it's highly dynamic. So a key difference we see between sites like Wikipedia and um, a more traditional view of knowledge and say an encyclopedia is that uh, this, the Wikipedia co-created knowledge is dynamic, evolutionary and adaptive. So it's always giving us the latest view. So knowledge has changed and evolved and the ways that we access that knowledge has changed and evolved too. So even if we just look at one facet of the social age, at learning itself, how has, has learning changed, you know, away from being formal, done in classrooms, taught by teachers, towards being uh, personal, often very relevant to us in the moment, to being geolocated, so giving you information that's relevant to you where you are, rather than just a, a, a generic type of information that could be relevant to anyone. It's often devolved into networks and communities. So we may still have and may still use formal sources of knowledge, but we're very often using our communities to extend and enhance um, the, the knowledge that we're accessing. And crucially, it's often co-created. So sessions like this become ones of sharing into a system, but the system itself will figure out what's true and what's valuable. So in an organizational context, we can no longer assume that just because we speak a story in a voice of authority and power, it's going to be taken to be true. Instead, what will happen is that that story will be taken by the community and there'll be some sense-making activity around it. What does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? Uh, what are we going to do about it? So it's in many ways a more democratized space, uh, although with the risk that people who don't have the right skills to survive and thrive in this space, can be disenfranchised and left behind in new and interesting ways. And we have to be very sort of conscious and aware of that. There is some risk that uh, the social age may simply broaden the gap between those who have and those who don't have, those who can and those who can't. Um, not simply through access to technology, although that is clearly one part of it, but largely to do with how people are able to use that technology, how they understand the new space, how they experience consequence, um, things like this. So um, we see these broad swathes of change and these are, these are not just things to tinker with. You know, we can't just um, make minor adaptations to what we do to fit this new space because they're fundamentally different. One of the real um, challenges that a lot of organizations face is being okay at the moment. Because being okay at the moment kind of convinces them that they're okay forever. But of course, it's the organizations right now which are able to take bold steps and fundamentally change the ways they operate, which will be best placed to, to take the steps further down the line. If you don't take these early steps now, if we're fundamentally continuing to do what we've always done, we're simply going to get left behind and swept away. Um, as this change continues to accelerate. So, you know, if we think about the, the technology, well, we, we clearly use it in lots of ways. Um, Organisations are used to using technology as infrastructure to hold files, to share files, to facilitate communication. We still do all that, but you'll see that a lot of the things that we do um, with the technology are really performance enhancing things there to let us you know identify things trends ideas people um to to capture and share to take photos and share to add stories around the things we share 
um, the, the network itself becomes less infrastructure, more almost part of the cognitive process because of this um, continual sort of looping round of uh, activity. So we don't simply prepare what we want to say and then log on to a system and broadcast it. We tend to, uh, you know, what we can call work out loud or co-create um, within these spaces. So we can maintain a view that technology is just infrastructure, but I'd argue quite strongly that it's far more than that. It's really become deeply embedded in the processes of how we think, how we operate, um, how we gain momentum. Uh, to put it another way, at a sort of bare minimum, if we don't have an understanding of how technology is impacting on the ways that we think and learn and work, then we're unlikely to be able to leverage the benefits of that. And I think what we can see is the people who do leverage this effectively and the organisations that are geared up to leverage it effectively um, are able to gain more traction. So it's all about this holistic pattern of adaptation. There's no one single feature we need to change that will get us fit for the social age it's a it's a holistic pattern of adaptation it's a broad process of change that we need to uh, that we need to follow so you know with that in mind what what will the organization of the future look like i mean we talked about the this is about the need for social leadership but leadership of course is not in isolation um, i use this slide to to characterize broadly that most organizations are still built around a rather Victorian notion of vertical hierarchies of power and control. So learning and development and HR and IT uh, are all designed to make the organization safe, to make it strong within a known ecosystem. So they're very good at controlling people and very good at uh, generating and accreting system and process to get people to do things in certain ways. But the very strength that comes through these vertical pillars makes them highly brittle and susceptible um, to disruption. And that's the kind of failure that we see uh, in the social age tends to be sudden fracture. It's not a sort of gradual decline. It's, uh, it may be experienced uh, as a sudden failure, Although, of course, the roots of it go back a long way. It's been interesting in the, the UK uh, just yesterday, I think, the last British home store's high street shop closed after 88 years. And one analysis is that it, uh, it simply uh, failed because it suddenly went bust, you know, it ran out of money. It was unable to trade. And that's true. You know, there were there were day by day operational conditions that broke it. But there's really a pattern of 20 years of failure where it simply didn't follow trends in the market. It was unable to evolve itself in line with an evolving um, ecosystem around it. The future organization is likely to be uh, lighter weight. And the key change is that the, the, the mechanisms within the organization, I'm just using these examples of HR or IT or learning and development, will be facilitating, not controlling. So they won't be saying, we know all the answers. They'll be saying, we can help you to uncover and surface the answers. And that, of course, is where social leadership really comes to the fore, because social leadership is the type of leadership which exists within these, within these spaces. Formal leadership only operates in formal spaces. Indeed, if we try to carry social leadership into um, social spaces it simply makes those spaces formal which is a real risk because we may believe we're hearing the voice of the community but actually we're hearing the voice that the community thinks we want to hear uh, so that they don't get sanctioned or, or or fail in some way so finally let's just sort of think in this section about change itself I'll, I'll, I'll look at this in a little more detail later but this is the most recent work i've been doing around organizational change looking at um, you know, how do organizations become dynamic? And what we're aiming for is the socially dynamic organization. And that's an organization which is going to be agile, not just through technology, not just through systems and process, um, not just through project management disciplines, is going to be dynamic because it's socially connected. It's, it's managed to achieve all this. It has deeply embedded and broad uh, connectivity. It has 
many social communities and crucially at an individual and organizational level it has a deeply un, a deep held understanding of how the world works you know it's fundamentally able to adapt because it's infrastructurally adapted to be able to adapt the other types of organization the resistant one at the bottom is one that just denies it needs to change and we still see some industries that are in that space uh, at least in in some ways I, i'd argue that um, some of the financial service industry is in that resistant space still it, it, it kind of knows it needs to change but it certainly denies it it doesn't say it denies it it has a sort of public face of change but uh, at a behavioral level we certainly at a cultural level indeed we see that it's it's fundamentally resistant to change constrained organizations are interesting they're ones that know they need to change uh, and indeed are doing a lot about it so they are um they're kicking off projects they've allocated budgets they are carrying out change in all these different areas but they're failing to align the energy of those different change efforts um which is broadly akin to kind of churning it's it's thrashing around in the water they're, they're well intentioned with good people doing good stuff but because it's not aligned the energy of that change tends to drain over time so what we're interested in is how do we become uh, entirely dynamic you know how do we actually adapt this uh, i won't go into detail on this today but you'll um some of you will know there's a, i've got a sort of a key article on this online and it's covered in a chapter in the book about other aspects of change in the social age uh, particularly notions of authenticity um, and the evolved social contract between individuals and organizations uh, if you like the fundamental basis on which people are engaged into the organization so understanding this ecosystem is a is a a key part of understanding the need for social leadership so let's uh, let's just move on and and look at uh, social leadership itself you know why do we why do we need it well it's really to do with momentum so um there's an aspiration of culture an aspiration of the organization we think we want to have that's what that's what many organizations sort of hold true they they hold up this aspiration uh, and 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 they believe that they have that thing or indeed that they can leverage that thing but of course culture is everywhere in every moment and is is what we experience day by day minute by minute and there's really a a huge gap between uh the aspiration of culture that we desire and the lived culture which is of course the culture we deserve it's the culture that we uh, we create ourselves and we create the space for that culture to emerge in so this is a space we're we're interested in is how do we move from an aspiration through to an actual culture you can't cheat being socially dynamic you can't just um you know spend money to evolve the office and make it open plan and nice and cozy you can't just give people new job titles and say on the website that you are agile and dynamic uh, all of those things are, are the facade they're the aspiration to be socially dynamic you just have to be socially dynamic uh, and the things that prevent us doing that are less the tangible uh, aspects uh, the things that we can easily see and measure they're more to do with mindset and underlying mechanisms of power authority and control so how does that relate to social leadership well you know we've got these two spaces on the one side we've got formal aspects of the organization formal leadership and formal is anything which the organization controls it's sort of anything that we can see around us which the organization has so if you're promoted or recruited it's into a formal structure if you go through any kind of organizational training it's formal organizational learning those aspects are easy to see and measure and they're the things that we can change easily so constrained organizations are changing all this stuff they're restructuring they're putting in place three year plans they're developing core competencies they're evolving their performance management frameworks they're adapting their technology they're doing all of the things which sit under their uh, direct control and yet they often fail uh, the social aspects of the organization are those which are held within the community so social authority differs from formal authority because 
formal authority is that which is bestowed upon us by the organization, whilst social authority is that which is given to us by the community itself. And it's awarded often based upon our actions into that community over time. Uh, so crucially, you can't buy social authority and neither can you gift social authority. The only thing you can gift is reputation. So if somebody speaks consistently highly of you, they may enhance your reputation and reputation is the foundation of social authority. Social authority is the foundation of social leadership. So just to be really clear about that, we build value within our communities over time. And we do that by acting in consistently fair and open ways. So we effectively have to live the end result. By doing so, we build a reputation over time for doing it. And as we build that uh, reputation and develop social authority, then we are able to channel that as a leadership potential. But crucially, it's a consensual uh, potential, if you like. So this is the space we're interested in, that social leadership space in the middle. And the, the social business, therefore, will be built not out of a marketing campaign or implementing social responsibility policies or just changing infrastructure. It will be built by developing social leadership at breadth and in depth within the organization and by embedding those principles of social learning uh, throughout everything the organization does so no longer reliant simply on formal leadership and formal learning but incorporating aspects of social leadership and social learning so it will be values driven but in a very real sense in the way that it's experienced in the moment not the types of values that we stick on a poster and, and, and nail up in the lift, but rather the values which are experienced and felt um, day by day. It will be responsible, it will be equal in everything it does. And crucially, it will be fully engaged in the social space. I'll just refer back to earlier when I said, to engage in the social space, you have to have social leadership. If you take your formal authority into social spaces, you either break them or are excluded from them. And that's really at the heart of why we need social leadership. We have to continue doing all the great formal stuff that we do and do that in formal spaces. And we have to develop the social side of what we do and use that in social spaces. So in this slide, I've tried to capture these two aspects of the organization, the formal aspect at the bottom, anything that systems and framework and process, all of that we need to adapt. And we know how to adapt that stuff. You know, good organizations know how to do organizational change. The social aspects are embedded within the community itself. And it's less about making it happen, more about creating the conditions in which it can emerge. So we need to have the right types of technology and relinquish control over the technology. We need to develop social leadership and create spaces where social leadership can flourish. We need to have a strong formal view of change, but also enable and empower dynamic change, which is co-created and co-owned in the moment. So let's just look at a, a couple of aspects of that. Um, here's a, a notion of, you know, how, how do messages travel in an organization? Well, in, in formal stories, go through formal channels. You know, they're, they're, they're broadcast to us by the organization. They're, they're, they're written up, they're signed off, and they're hand down, handed down and pushed out. In the social spaces, we can use this notion of nodes and amplifiers. So nodes are aggregating points in the network. These are people who have high reputation, I would argue high social leadership. They're respected and they're respected because of their actions over time. Now these people that are represented in orange here may have high social, may have high formal authority. Or of course, they may have no formal authority at all. They may simply hold social authority. And so, to, to, to look at this, we have these nodes, and the nodes are how amplification occurs. So if we're trying to affect organizational change or permeate messages through the organization, by tying into social networks, we're able to tie into different types of storytelling. Formal stories get told in formal voices and travel at the speed of formal stories, while social stories can be amplified and spread fast. But of course, you don't control them in the same way. You can't 
respond to a social story by saying you've got it wrong. You can only respond to a social story by saying, I have a different opinion, or can I add this information into it, or can I challenge that? But what you can't do is enforce it. You can't even silence it. So if the organization tries to stamp out these social voices, uh, they simply filter around the edge. It's like, you know, water over sand. It just filters its way through. So this is really a, a core aspect of how um, social leadership is often experienced within organizations, even ones which don't uh, recognize the validity of the notion of social leadership, even those resistant organizations that hold on to this, uh, this sort of Neolithic idea that they can somehow control groups of people. We can't because the social stories flow around us. What we're primarily interested in, in building the socially dynamic organization, is finding a new way of these two systems coexisting, the formal system and the social system. What architectures do we need in place in order to enable them to coexist? So on the one hand, we have to create development frameworks, development programs, ecosystems of technology, which allow all of this to happen. But secondly, and crucially, we have to relinquish control and ownership of it. So we can't make this happen using levers of formal power alone. We can only create the space where it may happen by building our reputation, by being fair, by being open and equal, and by nurturing and developing those nodes within the network who are the early adopters, effectively by building an embryonic change community of people who do get it and have social authority and are willing and able to, to help spread it. I just wanted to share this. Um, th some of this is more recent work. In fact, this slide, this is the first time I've, I've shared and talked about this slide. So uh, if I'm more hesitant around it, that's why this is uh, in the spirit of working out loud. This is early stage thinking about resilience itself. You know, resilience is a, a term we use um, really about the, the socially dynamic organization. How is it uh, more resilient? You know, how is it um, robust? So when we think about resilience, we need to think about individual resilience. So that takes us into the fields of sort of personal psychology um, and uh, understanding uh, the basis of individual resilience and adaptation over time. There's then sort of cultural resilience how coherent is the culture uh, we quite often see uh, under pressure that organizational cultures fail uh, we can see this in um, the metropolitan police for example where organizational culture has failed under accusations of institutionalized racism and homophobia there's been definite lines of fracture uh, this is probably part of the organ the, the um, story that's playing out in the u.s at the moment around what role do the police take? You know, how paramilitary is an organization? How much is it an arm of social good? Um, you know, could we argue that there is a coherent culture of policing at the moment in America? You know, probably not. There are probably multiple highly coherent subcultures. So as a whole, the system could be argued not to be resilient. It's actually a quite serious risk of fracture. Um, there are material aspects of resilience. These are well understood in terms of systems. Um, you know, how do we get technology to be resilient? Um, there are also these sort of ethical aspects of resilience. So it's all very well and good being, um, being sort of fair when times are good, but how do we act when we're under pressure? I'd argue that the socially dynamic organization is able to act fairly. Indeed, it recognizes that its fairness uh, its integrity is a core part of its ability to be socially dynamic. If we just do the nice things in nice times, then, then we're just holding the tokens of agility. We're not truly agile. Um, so, you know, those are the kind of aspects I'm thinking of around resilience at the moment. And how can we make the organisation, the socially dynamic organisation, more resilient, more able to cope with change? by uh, developing each of these aspects. And social leadership, you know, here is the, the model of social leadership from the book. And as, as I said earlier, I'm not gonna go into detail on this model today. Um, 
although you'll probably recognize a lot of the words I have been talking about. We're going to do a separate webinar where we'll look in detail at all of these. But the, the model of social leadership is really a developmental pathway for how we, uh, you know, we start at curation, how we choose a space, you know, how do we ground ourselves within our, our, our own um, power? Where, where, where do we take a stance? How do we tell our stories and learn to tell stories that are amplified? If you remember that, that slide here, you know, we know how to tell formal stories, but as social leaders, we need to tell social stories, ones which are amplified by the nodes in the network. And that's not accidental. That's a skill that we can build by understanding how stories work and how we phrase them in certain ways, how we adapt and evolve them in certain ways and how we share. You know, the sharing is a core part of learning, of working out loud, of being agile, being unafraid of consequence because we understand that consequence itself is more temporary. Um, so building those skills, understanding how communities work, where they sit within the organisation, how they're facilitated, how they're controlled. Hence that reputation into authority, which we've, which we've talked about already. And then the pinnacle of social leadership as we embed uh, this kind of capability deeply through the organization, we're able to co-create effectively. So that's the point where we can switch from relying on formal types of knowledge and formal process and system to ones where we have a, an embedded problem solving, uh, innovative and creative potential within the community. But again, you can't get that simply by instituting a, an innovation program or a creativity program. You have to get it by evolving the entire organization. You have to evolve HR to be facilitating, not controlling. You have to evolve IT to be facilitating, not controlling. You have to open learning up to tacit tribal knowledge, not simply formal stories. Social capital is our ability to um, help others succeed effectively. It's one's ability to survive and thrive in this place. So social leaders will be expert at developing social capital in others. Uh, and they will, of course, have high social capital themselves. And through all of that, we're able to collaborate, not just in the good times, but in the hard times. So the socially dynamic organisation, uh, the, the organisation at the top here, which gains momentum and indeed is able to effectively change, is one which is deeply connected. So what makes the organization socially dynamic? Well, what makes it dynamic is its people, its technology, its systems, its processes, but crucially its mindset. And that's really what we're, what we're aiming for. It's able to generate momentum because it can align all of the different energies of change. So just to sort of wrap up this, and then we'll have some time for, for questions and kicking ideas around. I just want to share um, this really most recent work around uh, the socially dynamic organization itself. You know, so what, uh, what do we understand the socially dynamic organization to be and what makes it socially dynamic? So in this slide, and I apologize it's a bit clustered, but as, uh, uh, cluttered, but as I said, I'm working out loud on these ideas. I've written about five core pieces around it at the moment. And um, maybe we'll be able to to boil this down in time but these are if you like all of the aspects which are impinging on on my thinking at the moment it is of course dynamic through leadership so i would argue it has uh, strong formal leadership remember none of this is about abandoning formal leadership but it has strong social leadership and you'll see all of those words that sit around leadership are the words that we just looked at a moment ago in the in the model itself it will have technology, but it will be a diverse ecosystem of technology. Uh, and I think this is a real fundamental shift. It's a shift um, in the vendor marketplace and it's a shift in our social marketplace. So in the old world, um, infrastructure was big and heavy and providers tried to do everything. You know, they wanted to, to own the whole cake. Uh, what we've seen primarily through the emergence of sort of app type approaches and pockets of social technologies is that we're, we're used to picking up and disposing of apps randomly. We're, we're not spending £400 on an app, although interestingly we might spend £400 on a phone, um, but we're just going to pick up the thing which is most useful. Um, so we, uh, you know, we pick those things up which are valuable and put down those things which aren't valuable. So the, 
the uh, technology will be more democratized, highly adaptive, uh, lightweight, interconnected and fluid. Uh, this is a, a key thing for organizations to crack, how they effectively, uh, I almost want to say, I'll, I'll bring myself to say it in this context, we need to disband the IT department that believes it owns and controls technology. And we need to replace it with a connected, responsible, uh, lightweight, facilitating function, which will listen to what you have to say about technology because in the social space you're as expert as they are that's the, really what we're needing to do is, is, is fundamentally change the organization learning we've touched on a little already and change i've talked about that co-owned co-created nature of change but the other aspect i put in here is about performance because performance itself is often measured at the moment within organizations as, as compliance effectively as the ability to to live the line, to toe the line of what the organization says and to deliver expected results. But we may need to think about how performance relates to agility and risk taking, um, how we devolve perhaps some aspects of performance management. It, it kind of already is devolved, but the formal system fails to recognize it. Um, it's, it it's just about, um, the way that we're able to uh, to, to recognise the, the layers of tacit tribal knowledge which are held within the community. So we need all of these aspects pulled together to become socially dynamic. By doing so, we get this diversified strength. This is a key phrase that I'm kind of using around this. A diversified strength is not one which is held within formal hierarchy and which is codified within systems and processes. It's held by, it's held together by unified values. So through the strongly coherent culture, this is why we need a strong and unified culture, because that's the thing which holds us together. Um, it, 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 but it's a diversified strength, it's reconfigurable. This is the crucial thing. A, a formal, the formal layers of an organization can be strong, but highly brittle and susceptible to fracture. Whilst uh, the socially dynamic organization is diverse because in response to pressure, it flows around it, it's able to change, it's inherently agile. Um, guided, not governed is, is, is quite a, a sort of key term within this. A, a diversified strength uh, is a series of spaces in which people are able to operate. So it's, it's agile um, by design and in depth through its, its unconformity. I don't know if that's really a, a, a real word, but I'm going with it. You know, it's not about con, con, conforming to standards. It's about, it's, it's the unconformity, but its ability to prototype and iterate and innovate that allows the organization itself to be agile. It's, it's deeply fair. It's not just sort of surface level fair. It has fairness and equality in depth throughout everything it does and Im embedded curiosity. Um, democratized potential so we don't just um, pull everything together around the formal hierarchy we, we disperse and devolve much more of it that's why the socially dynamic organization is able to be lightweight and scaffolded rather than heavyweight and controlling uh, and it's a, it, these are these are really key changes and of course there's a lot of work to achieve this you can't just tinker with one aspect of the organization and do it. It has to be led um, through a deep understanding within the executive of the organization that this is where they need to get to and a willingness to relinquish the control to get us there. So the, the socially dynamic organization will, will conduct sense-making activity by tying into the very best of the formal aspects and the very best of the social aspects of the organization so I'll, I'll say again it's the best of both everything that we've always done which has delivered success in our organization so far we need to continue to do that we need to adapt and evolve it for sure but this isn't about throwing that stuff away it's just recognizing that that's only half of what we need the other half are the social aspects and that really is why we need social leadership because if we just rely on formal, 
we won't be able to become socially dynamic. Indeed, uh, in this diagram, you know, we'll be stuck forever looking at the aspiration of um, social leadership, uh, or the, sorry, the aspiration of the culture that we need, rather than uh, actually building the culture that we need. Because the energy for change has to come from within the system through having deeply connected and engaged and empowered individuals, ones who are empowered by the system, not simply controlled by it. If we rely on, um, if we rely on energy which is imported from outside, if we try to push the system, it's static until we push it and it tends to stall, it lacks permission. At the heart of the, the dynamic change framework is this internal energy, which is both self-starting and self-sustaining. And we won't achieve that simply with formal layers of leadership. We need to embed those social layers of leadership as well. So, you know, I'll just sort of start to wrap up. In, in the next um, webinar, we uh, will look in depth at the, the model itself, the, that net model of social leadership, and ask how do we develop that capability within an organization um, and how in detail does that drive change itself if you don't have a copy of the book i know i can see from some of the names on the screen some of you do have some of you might not have just uh drop me a note oh, in fact if you'd like any of the books uh drop me a note but these are the contact details here i'll very happily send a, a, a copy out to you and I'll uh, thank you all for um, for coming along to this, which is actually our very first uh, sea salt webinar and the fir first of this series around social leadership. Um, but we've got um, a little bit of time. If anybody has any any questions, any points they'd like to raise, um, then now is now is the time. Or of course on Twitter later if you missed the opportunity now. So just um. I've got I've got one whilst um, just waiting for people to formulate their thoughts on the chat. Um, thank you for the presentation. That's, that's really interesting stuff. Um, what, what would be your best recommendations, seeing as a lot of this seems to be about power and control and, um, and a, a new, new approaches in, in those kind of spheres? How might you tackle an intransigent executive where they're just not buying this at the moment? But, uh, people are able to sort of demonstrate ways of, of, of proving this to be a, a good approach. I mean, what recommendations might you give to someone in the trenches or middle management who would, re would really like to see their organisation adopt these um, approaches, but yet they're, they're, they're facing a bit of a, a cliff face to get these messages across? Well, I mean, in the um, so specifically within the, the um, dynamic change work, we look at how um, how we make the change story magnetic and we start by creating an external change space a change community which is the people who do want to be involved so the first thing we do is work with a small group of people who get it and want to be involved and they can help do that initial sense making and we then find ways to reach out to those perhaps um, bastions of resistance um, in order to involve them in the story so instead of trying to push them we um we try to let me try and do that richard uh, so we're just back to video i think instead of trying to push them we try to pull them so we invite uh, their opinion into things and if their opinion is that they disagree with us then that's okay because of course one of the most painful things about um about change is that we have to also change ourselves so in a co-created and co-owned model of change, uh, I don't get what I want, uh, or at least I don't get all of it, but I get my voice heard and I get some of it, uh, and you probably get the same. So uh, it's, a, it's a consensual uh, model of, of change effectively. The organisation gets to steer it, and that person who is resistant is resistant for lots of good reasons. You know, we have to uh, understand those and work with them. Um, but that's the, that's the, overall, if you like, the um, the principle of a co-created model is that we engage through magnetism. Magnetism, uh, because of course, if, if if we try to push or pull, we we get nowhere. Uh, in fact, 
we just embed it. There's a lot of interest at the moment, um, particularly in the US around, um, around the way that uh, politics is changing away from uh, facts and evidence towards uh, it, the blustering kind of approach and mass social movement. The interesting thing is that as on, a, on the whole, there's a great deal of research that shows we are deeply resistant to logical arguments for change. So, you know, if you don't believe in climate change, and I do believe in climate change, and I have all the evidence to prove it, the thing we know pretty much for sure is that you're not going to change your mind based on the evidence, because mm -hmm. your position, <clears throat> it's not based on a factual understanding. It's based on a, a constructed belief system, if you like, and belief systems are not susceptible to the uh, type of energy uh, that, that we can influence with, with facts and data. They're more emotive. And, and that's really the, the challenges that we face in, in organizations. You know, we have to, um, we have to uh, tie into these different types of energy Indeed, in some of the other work I'm doing at the moment around uh, more in military contexts, actually, we have to look at how we depower those scripts, you know, because they, they carry great power. And you can't simply um, you can't simply use force to prevent them having power. You can't deny them a voice. You can't deny the validity of their voice. You have to find other ways. Mm. So I hope that sort of helps. And uh, there's a question here about... Uh, we see that work in education yes of course um working with teachers who are up for trying things outside of the formal system to connect more broadly with people in the wider community my feeling is that the school community is artificially restricted so can be worked around rather than engaged at formal levels Does this seem like a sound way forward in the formal education environment i mean you know yes absolutely i guess uh, in some ways we can consider uh what we're looking at is um Build, building in rehearsal spaces. Sometimes I, I, I talk in this context. An organization needs three types of spaces. It needs learning spaces, which will consist of formal materials and formal stories and formal aspects of learning. And it needs performance spaces where we come together to actually perform. Uh, but it needs rehearsal spaces, and these are often lacking. Uh, very often, rehearsal spaces are actually performance spaces or they're treated like performance spaces and so they become a high consequence um and I, I, almost what you're talking about there is that it's it, it it's like the space outside the formal system but within our professional practice um to to learn you know so within the formal environment we may be restricted in certain ways not just by systems but also by permissions so by operating within a change space, by creating a, a space where people can impose new types of permission or claim new types of permission, we're able to do the exploring, which will help us to, you know, help us to thrive. So uh, I think, you know, in answer to your question, it's a very sound way forward in a formal education environment. Uh, indeed, I, I would argue that um, it's the most responsible thing to do because education itself as you know, is highly susceptible to the disruption that we're seeing uh, all around us. I mean, I think that the, the universities are in a fight for their lives at the moment. They may not yet um, be fully recognising or appreciating it, but the, as learning changes, then the institutions that provide learning also need to change. And crucially, the ways that we structure and support learning need to change. And who else is going to figure this out than you, know, than you your colleagues, people who are connected in these change spaces? If we don't figure it out, the market will figure it out for us and we'll see a, a disruption of um, systems or worse, politicians will impose it upon us uh, as you know, their version of how they think it needs to change. So I think it's a very, valuable activity to be to be carrying out do you have any more questions on the uh forum uh, 
Thank you. It's nice to connect here as well, Leo. I know we've been connected on the blog and on Twitter for um, quite some time. So I um, appreciate your, your support and feedback around all of those ideas. Okay. I think if, uh, if that's all we have, that's, we'll bring that to a halt there. Thank you very much, Julian, for your time. <clears throat> and thank you to all the viewers and participants for um, their questions and uh, watching this as well. Uh, do look out for the following webinars. Uh, we'll be help holding uh, a few more of these as we go through and um, look forward to speaking to you again. Thanks. Bye.